暇じゃないんでね。For calling on his babysitter. まあ、言っといてくれよ、付き人、お前の親分に。Let me say this, you, young boy. Oh, well, that doesn't need any translation. Welcome back to the Rant and Review Pro Wrestling. We're catching up with New Japan Pro Wrestling and JPW of Wrestling Dontaku that happened this week.、Uh, a lot of stuff going down on this show. We captured pretty much everything that happened on the Road to Show, or a couple other things that happened since I last talked about this on the tour leading up to this show. And that would manifest itself very early on in the show. But before we get into that, I want to remind you that we've got some goodies down below. In fact, One of the links down below is to a very cool documentary、uh, from a couple years ago about Will Ospreay. If you haven't seen it, it's on Amazon.、Uh, it's, I think it's 99 cents、uh, with the link down below. But you can get that documentary and check it out about the international pro wrestler、uh, featuring Will Ospreay and lots of other wrestlers. It's kind of a good trip back in time to、uh, what I consider right now, at this point in time, the mid 2010s. To be a golden age in pro wrestling, and I, I think it will go down as that in the future. So, check the link down in the description box below and see if you want to check out that documentary. But Osprey, not on this show, but his United Empire would definitely have a presence very early on. Whoever was first, the people that stole the tag team championships from Kyle Fletcher and Mark Davis, Ozzy Open, the House of Torture come out to open the show in an eight man against Bishimon.、Uh, Along with Toro Yanu and Sho, and the match didn't go very, very long. So, the first, the House of Torture comes out, Evil and Yujiro have the tag titles. They don't actually own the titles, they're not the champions, they just stole them from Ozzy Open. You got, they're trying to force the ring announcer to call them the tag team champions. So, Bishimon comes out, they've got no time for House of Torture. They be, start beating the crap out of them, throw them around the ring, throw them out into the crowd. This match ends in like three or four minutes before Bishimon has pinned them and just beaten the House of Torture. Of course, the House of Torture comes in and they try to gang up on him, but we get Aussie Open and the Great Okan coming out, and Aussie Open, with a couple of nut shots, regains their, the possession of their actual tag team championships.、Uh, they didn't get on the mic and say, hey, you know what, Bishimon, we do respect you, so we will grant you a title shot. House of Torture, not so much. You guys are kind of crap, and, you, and we don't want to give you a title shot, but you're going to just keep doing this nonsense, stealing our titles, attacking us, doing whatever crazy stuff you can to get attention. So, you know what? We're going to do a triple threat match for the tag titles.、Uh, fairly dangerous thing, as we've seen in the past for a champion. Ask MJF、uh, to, uh, over in AEW about opening yourself up to being. In a three way or four way match, but Aussie Open fairly confident that they can get the win here、uh, over the,、uh, their challengers here in New Japan Pro Wrestling after that big win they have over TMDK.、Uh, and New Japan's tag division looking fairly lively now. Speaking of TMDK, this rolled right into the match where TMDK came out、uh, to fit and have a nice little six man tag match. And this continuing rivalry that seems to be going on between. TMDK and、uh, the United Empire.、Um, another fair, decent match. We got to see TMDK and Aussie Open kind of continue their Texas Tornado style of wrestling with the high spots in the middle of the match, which is pretty good. Aussie Fujita, who is kind of an honorary member of TMDK, even though he officially is still a young lion, getting in the face a little bit of the great Okan here, who is the Rev Pro champion, and kind of press possibly hitting towards that being a match. I can't, I mean, it may happen, but Fuji's not beating Okan, he's not winning the British Heavyweight Championship. But they did, you know, there was a big win here for the United Empire, continuing their dominance、uh, on the scene. This further continued into the next match where we had, we're now bringing in more members of the United Empire. With、uh, Catch 2 2, the now former IWGP Junior Tag Team Champions, and TJP stole a giant bandage on his head from the cut. Now, Chris Charlton on English commentary said that that big gash that TJP got was apparently from a fingernail from Kevin Knight. You gotta trim your fingernails, guy. He, <laughs> what, what is that?、Uh, I'm sure he got a lot of flack for that in the back. I mean, that's a pretty bad, that's an unnecessary gash. And it was a pretty nasty gash. The fact that TJP s still wearing his big, huge bandage over his head and apparently had stitches and glue and duct tape to hold him together in his match. But 
Uh, Catch 2 2, they're teaming up with Aaron Hanare here to take on Shota Umino, Shooter coming out, along with the new IWGP Junior Tag Team Champions, Kushida and Kevin Knight. Another fun, you know, multi man tag match. They're really like rocketing through these in Dontaku here, which makes me think some of the big main event matches are going to go for pretty long. Uh, a lot of jaw jacking back and forth. Kushida gets this really sweet looking roll up on TJP to get the win in the match. Uh, this is probably setting up a rematch. I said in my review of the Road 2 show that I do think the Catch 2 2 is probably going to regain these junior tag team championships. This is probably just a way to kind of introduce Kevin Knight to the New Japan audience and give him a good run in there and give Kushida something to do uh, outside of going into the juniors division. All that's going to change as we will later in the night find out some more information about best of the super juniors which is coming up in a couple of weeks we then led into one of the final preliminary matches of the night we had los ingobernables de Japón, the team of bushi tetsuya naito and the now former king of pro wrestling champion shingo takagi taking on just five guys represented by just three guys of just five guys the new king of pro wrestling champion uh tai chi good old burr face he's teaming with doki and Kanemaru, and uh, this this was a dusting. Um, outside of Shingo and Taichi kind of going back and forth at each other in the middle of the match, and <laughs> they were calling out to some, somebody in the crowd, and the, Shingo would call out to the guy, and then Taichi would call out to the guy, and the crowd started laughing about it. It was pretty funny. Just Five Guys, too, also did this weird thing where they didn't come down the entrance ramp. They went around through the crowd to make their entrance into the ring, kind of like old school style, which I, I, I appreciated that a little bit. Uh, by the way, they, they brought out the big stage set up here for the Wrestling the Otaku show, which looked awesome on camera. But this was a dusting from absolutely from just five guys. The match ends not too long into it, about seven, eight, nine minutes into it, with Tai Chi putting a submission on, on Bushi. You got Kanemaru putting a figure four on Shingo, and you got Naito in the Doki Choki. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> from Doki and you know there's no help for Bushi Bushi's got a tap and that's the end of the match just five guys literally rolling over Los Ingobernables de Japón um I don't know what that portended for later in the night because again the main event is another just five guys versus LIJ matchup when uh Hiromu challenges Sonata but before we get into that we got a lot more announcements here for things upcoming in New Japan Pro Wrestling next up we had the NJPW Strong Never Open Weight Championship. This is a lot of championships in New Japan, and they they did touch on this in the on the broadcast team, but just, just still just a lot of titles. But it was Kenta defending the championship against Hikaleu. Now remember, this is the you know ten year anniversary sort of of well, it is a ten year anniversary of Bullet Club, which was established, which means it's the ten year anniversary of me coming back to New Japan Pro Wrestling because I started watching. My, this current run of New Japan is about a month after Bullet Club formed. So I've been watching this version of New Japan for about uh, 10 years now. It's been that long. Uh, man, time flies. But uh, Kenta defending the title and defending the honor of Bullet Club here, sort of against a former member of Bullet Club, Hikaleu. And Hikaleu came in here right off the bat. He just boots Kenta in the face. Look, Kenta. Looks like he's knocked out before the bell even starts. So the referee's checking him. It's like, what's going on? Okay. Then they ring the bell. Kenta was playing possum and tried to catch Hikaleu off guard, roll him up, but that didn't really work out too well. Hikaleu was just too big and too strong. Kenta did work the leg. He did everything he possibly could to work against the big man here. But, you know, he would throw something at him and then Hikaleu would come back, hit him with a bunch of power moves. Kenta did get the advantage a little bit later on in the match. Still working on the knees. But then, <laughs> a wonderful part of the match, the referee takes a boot from Hikaleu by accident. It looks so nasty. The crowd is just gasping <laughs> because it's such a bad... He just crumbles into a heap on the mat. So Kenta takes his opportunity to go outside the ring and get the kendo stick. And he starts beating the crap out of Hikaleu over and over and over and over and over again with the kendo stick. And I'm like, what was Jado doing? Jado gets up on the apron and now I know why it really didn't matter if Jado did anything. Because as soon as Jado got up on the apron, Kenta swiped the crap out of him with the kendo stick, sent him down to the floor. Hikaleu eventually caught the kendo stick that started a fray, took the kendo stick and broke it over his knee. 
Then he called for Marty and Sami and another referee to come to the ring. Marty comes in, starts refereeing the match. He gets blindsided a little bit. So enough for Kenta to kind of throw a low blow and try to get a cheap win. Uh, hits the Basico knee, doesn't get the pin. He even puts on the game over, doesn't put, get the pin. Kenta's trying everything he possibly can do to get the pin and beat Hikaleu, but it does not work. Hikaleu eventually catches him in that snap power slam and then lifts him up for the dunk, which is what I'm going to call it, which is Hikaleu's version of the power slam. Dunks Kenta right into the mat. One, two, three is your new strong, never open weight champion. His first single title, I believe, in New Japan Pro Wrestling. And uh, yeah, he gets to celebrate. Kenta gets to slump off to the back. And uh, yeah, our first title match, and we got a new champion already on the night. Next up is what I think is going to become very quickly one of my favorite rivalries this year, just from this match alone, is the NJPW World TV Championship match. Zack Sabre Jr. of TMDK defending against Jeff Cobb of the United Empire. Both guys, again, as I mentioned this in the Road 2 shows, these factions are now doing kind of a thing that I've always wanted them to do uh, that's been kind of lost in New Japan, which is bringing the other guys of the, of your faction out to ringside to second you in a corner in these big title matches or these big main event matches. So we got TMDK seconding Zach. We got the United Empire seconding Jeff Cobb. Jeff Cobb kind of probably following what Hikaleo did in the first match. He starts off strong, starts off fast. He's got the size and the power advantage. And even though Zack Sabre Jr. has in the last year put on some weight, He's still nowhere near the size and the mass of Jeff Cobb. It takes a good five minutes of Zach barely holding on to finally start getting an advantage in this match. He starts trying to work over some body parts. And I didn't think about this going into this match, but this is why this match is such a great uh, matchup. And as they say, matchups make matches. Zack Sabre Jr. is known for doing a lot of counters and submissions and unique counters in the submissions and Jeff Cobb is known for doing a lot of unique counters into throws and suplexes so you've got these, these two guys who are good counter wrestlers one is a good counter submission wrestler one's a good counter power wrestler and the matchup of these two is absolute magic I love this match this match was so much fun the crowd was into this Zach had this thing he was kept trying to German suplex Jeff Cobb it wasn't gonna happen and Cobb will keep going for some he hit some power moves and basically bounced Zach around the ring, almost a couple of times bounced Zach out of the ring. Zach would come back in, get a counter. Jeff would try to get out of it, and they just kept playing this game of chess between each other all the time. These 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 two guys have really good chemistry, and I love, again, the clash of the styles of both of these two guys really played out in this match. The match, however, went to a time limit draw. I kind of saw it coming, and after the match, uh, Zach Sabre Jr. didn't want, he, he didn't, take that as a win it was a time limit draw he stole the njpw world tv champion but he didn't even want the belt and he went over to jeff cobb was like look i didn't beat you you didn't beat me and they're like jawing back and forth like we're gonna do it again we're gonna do it again right and i'm like yes please yes please i want to see these two guys wrestle at least two <laughs> i could go for one or two more matches between jeff cobb and zach saber jr a combination that i did not know i wanted but having seen this match and their rematch, which I don't know, it's going to be in, in Long Beach or if they're going to do it at Dominion or whatever, if they're going to meet in the G1, I want to see. I mean, they met before, but this in this 15 minute time limit TV title match uh, format, I really, really enjoy the way they perform this. It reminds me as an old school fan of Mike Rotundo back in the day of the NWA when he was a TV champion and him taking on guys like Dr. Def Steve Williams. There's the same kind of dynamic here uh, for a modern audience. I absolutely love this. Um, and again, I want to see these two go at it again. Then we have one of the weirdest, most moving parts match of the night. I guess that's a way to describe it. It's the never open weight six-man tag team championship match. Strong style of Minoru Suzuki, El Desperado, and Ren Narita defending against the makeshift team of Kazushiko Okada, Tomohiro Ishii, and Hiroshi Tanahashi. Now, first off, there was, I, and I mentioned this on the Road 2 review, that it was probably going to be Tanahashi who was the ex, the uh, mystery partner, where it really wasn't a mystery. But Tanahashi had a rib injury. So Tanahashi decides late, he just declares himself that he's going to be ex. Now, this would be fine and dandy, but New Japan throwing a bit of a wrinkle in this one where Ishii is not happy that Tanahashi is going to be partnering with him and Okada in his match. He wanted it to be an all chaos thing. And 
I, I, you know, it's it's a weird dynamic there because there's a little bit of a, a rivalry here between Ishii and Tanahashi on their side. Even though Tanahashi, you know, he's the ace, he's a legend and everything else, he is also coming in with a legitimate bum rib section and a rib injury. Also on top of this, this whole thing is coming about because Ren Narita, trying to follow in kind of the Kiyomiya thing, called out Okada, and Okada does not appreciate when people who are young guys who he doesn't think are his level call him out. So there's that aspect of it. Then you also had the fact that El Desperado and Ishii have been going at it for the last couple weeks on this tour. So all these combustible elements are coming into this never open way six man tag team match, which results in pure magic. This match is absolutely fun as hell. These guys, there's all this stuff going on and all of these pairings and all these things going on back and forth. We got Minoru Suzuki and Tanahashi reviving their old rivalry for the last 12 years. And of course, Suzuki's the first one to exploit the injury to the ribs of Tanahashi by hitting him with that gut punch that he likes to do and putting him in a lot of uh, octopus stretches. Then we get Narita trying to big up Okada and failing miserably time and time again. He does get some good shots in on Okada. He's trying desperately to pin Okada. He really wants to pin Okada to the detriment of his team. Also, during this thing, at one point in time, between Ishii and El Desperado slapping the crap out of each other, Ishii's holding Desperado, and Tanahashi comes in and tries to slap Desperado, but misses and hits Ishii. Then Desperado pushes Ishii into Tanahashi, so that's not working well for their team. Then they have... It's, it, there's so much crazy stuff going on. However, it does wind up with coming down to Ren Narita and Okada, and Okada does manage to hit the Rainmaker does get the three count and wins the never open way six man tag team championships. Well, first off, when they won the match, Okada being the kind of dickhead Okada that he's been recently, which is the story from this year, he's kick, you know, the old saying is don't kick a man when he's down. And Ren Narita is down and Okada's kind of kicking at him and mocking him while he's beating on the mat, which Minoru Suzuki doesn't take too kindly to. So then he gets up in Okada's face. Then Ta Tanahashi and Ishii try to step in the middle of this and they're drawing back. He's drawing back and forth with Okada because Okada was kicking. And Desperado comes in, they get Ren Narita, they get out the ring, they're very ticked off. Then we have the problem of the fact that Ishii, after winning this match, he's they're giving him the belts, and Ishii looks like he, he's like, oh shit, I gotta be a tag team partner with Tanahashi now. He don't even look like he wants the belt. <laughs> so they're trying to get them to all raise hands. And Ishii's just like this. He's just like, no, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not feeling this tag team. I got to be stuck with this dude now. I, don't even, I didn't even want him on the team. Now I'm champions with him. Now I'm stuck with him for God knows how long. So there's that conflict. And as if that wasn't enough, then we get Shota Umino coming to the ring. So I'm like, well, what's Shota doing here? Because Shota was one of the guys. It's amazing how much has come out of that tag match that they had a couple months ago. Shota was the guy, other guy with Ren Narita in that tag match against uh, Tanahashi and Okada that got dusted. So Ren Narita now sees his shot. He comes to the ring by himself. He talks to Okada and says, hey, you know, you know, basically laying down a challenge. Then we get the video screen. And of all people, of course it is, John Moxley on the video screen saying, hey, how are you going to do my young boy like that? I guess I'm going to have to come back. So John Moxley is coming to Dominion to probably team with Shota Umino and their mystery partner to take on the never open weight six man tag team champions, which is a team that doesn't even want to be together with Okada with the first title Okada has held. That was not the world heavyweight championship, the top company title. He's now a tag team champion with his old rival Tanahashi, who's battling jaw jacking with Ishii, who don't even want him in the tag team, don't even want to be in a tag team. And we don't know who Shota and John Moxley's partner is going to be. And then to top all of that off, if that wasn't enough, Ren Arita kind of, uh, uh, Shota Umino throws a line back in Okada's face. And as he's leaving the ring, Okada, <laughs> Okada gets on the microphone and says something to him. He goes, you know, basically he says, you know what? And fuck you. <laughs> you know what's good about this is because for so long, Ishii and, and, and Minoru Suzuki in particular haven't had much of anything important to do in New Japan. It has been kind of going through the routine, but it's lo I like seeing all of these moving pieces within the never open way six man tag team division. It's like they kind of take a hint from AEW in the way they're handling the six man tag titles because the never open way six man tags have been around for a while. They were kind of a joke for a couple years. 
uh, Ishii and Bishimon made it a good thing last year, made the title mean something last year, and then the House of Torture came in and kind of screwed it up. But now it's kind of the title that's kind of focusing around a lot of these feuds. Like, there's like four feuds going on <laughs> within this. One of the feuds is within the team that is the champions. <laughs> This is really good stuff. I want to see more of this from New Japan. Well done on this whole thing. The rivalry, the lead-in, the match, the conclusion of the match, and now the next challengers. And yes, Mox is coming. Got, is he going to bring Shota Umino with him? Is he bringing Brian Danielson with him? Is he bringing Claudio with him? Is it going to be somebody else that's going to team with him and Shooter? We're going to have to stay tuned for this one. I'm definitely going to be following this one and keeping you guys abreast on this if we get any news on who this third partner is going to be with them and what Tanahashi and Ishii are saying. Well, probably more Ishii saying stuff about Tanahashi in the press. And can Okada keep this team together? And is he just going to be keep being a dickhead to all the young guys who are coming after him? I don't know, man. I just loved it. Now we're getting into the hard, hard work on this show. It is the Never Open Way Championship, which I guess is now ascended to being the secondary championship in New Japan as Tamatanga, who, by the way, has been wrestling in New Japan without a contract. And there apparently is word that his interest from wwe is kind of dried up so i'm not sure what's going on here he's defending the championship against david finley the new leader of a gaijinless bullet club this is it's a very hard scenario here we, again this is the 10-year anniversary of bullet club a decade of bullet club tamatanga one of the original leaders they start out hot and heavy in this match and the story of this match is that they were doing everything in this match that they possibly could to get David Finley over with the crowd. And the crowd was dead silent for a lot of this match. They were still have not bought into David Finley. I think a lot of fans across the board have not bought into David Finley yet. Um, but they did, look, they put the effort in. I can't say whether or not he's gonna work out. It's the same thing. We, we've had this with almost every single new leader of Bullet Club from Kenny Omega. A lot of people forget when Kenny Omega took over, people weren't really buying it at the beginning. Same thing with Jay White and Finley. Finley's got an uphill. Uh, he's got a big shoes to fill and a big mountain to climb. But uh, this match, they went back and forth for a while. But ultimately, it came down to Finley hitting, I think, four or maybe even five power bombs, kind of taking a page from Warlow here. Uh, and then he kept pulling up Tom and Tonga. He wouldn't go for, he wouldn't let the pin happen. Then he hit two of the now into in, into oblivion, which used to be called his finisher, the trash panda. And then he finally got the pin, finally got the three count. They had a stretcher Tom and Tonga out, which, uh, by all means might be, might mean that this is Tom and Tonga's last, uh, match in new Japan for the foreseeable future. If not forever. Um, Again, they, this is everybody here did their part well. The match was a good match. It was a decent match. It wasn't anything spectacular, but it gets it gets across that David Finley is a killer. Like he says, it's a savage. Like he said, he is a man of his word. He said Tomatonga wasn't walking out, and Tomatonga didn't walk out. He got stretched out of the arena. Um, Try to put him over. Crowd still wasn't quite feeling it at the end. We then get a run in from El Fantasma, who finally made his return. He attacked Gato and David Finley, but uh, you know some of the crowd was the crowd's much more in the ELP than they are for David Finley. They they pop when ELP came out, and ELP apparently now is part of Hontai, even though his theme music is still the same old uh, Bullet Club remix that it was before. But I'm sure that you know maybe that'll change in the future. But um, I'm interested. I'm I want to see a David Finley El Fantasma match again. I don't know how into people as but japanese don't seem to be too into david finley as the leader uh the western fans on online don't seem to be too into it i'm still willing to give it a couple more months to see how the experiment works out and if it so but this by all rights they did the right thing here they did everything they could they did the right stuff it's just whether or not people are going to buy into it or not and it may take time or it may not ever happen um i wouldn't want to be david finley it's a this is a big sandwich he's trying to take a bite out of He's trying to take it, man. Let's see. I'm going to still give it time to see what happens with it. I'm going to talk about this more in the future. And I'll probably, I'm, I've been thinking about doing a video over the last week about, you know, things David Finley, in my opinion, as a fan, obviously not an expert, but as a fan, in my opinion, things that might make me 
feel that he gets over as the new leader of Bullet Club. But uh, once again, we have two new never, we have three new never open weight champions. All three never open weight titles changed hands tonight. But the next one up is the big one. It is for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. Romo Takahashi, the junior heavyweight champion, challenging his former stablemate and Los Ingobernables de Japón, Sonata. So did this match deliver? Uh, it delivered. It wasn't like a match of the year contender. Uh, Hiromu and Sonata, their chemistry's there. Um, they, they, they've they only had one match before, and I think they referenced it, and they did reference it actually on on uh, both commentary teams, how it was a long time ago, but when he's got, like, I think way back in 2011, 2012, was the last time Sonata and Hiromu had a one-on-one -on -one match. But this was a thrilling match. The crowd was very much behind Hiromu. Hiromu is a, such a sympathetic baby face. He always will get the crowd behind him, uh, cheering him on, even though we all pretty much knew he wasn't gonna win this match. There were a couple very, very close near falls, but I think my suspension of disbelief just wasn't there. Cause I'm like, Sonata's not gonna lose on V1 and he's he's not gonna lose to a junior heavyweight. That would completely ruin all of the work they've just done to kind of rehab his character. But it wasn't pretty, it was a good match. I did, it was, it would be fun. I would suggest you guys watching it. Um, Sonata does get the win in the end. Hiromu didn't make it easy for him though. Just five guys basically sweeping Los Ingobernables de Hilpon. They all leave the ring looking beater, beaten, battered, and man, just like, man, LIJ just got ran out the building in both matches by just five guys. Boy, they're on downturn, aren't they? Uh, not so much, because after Sonata gives his post-match speech, out comes Yoda Suji. Yes, that's right, Yoda Suji. The young lion has returned looking a lot better shape than he was when he left for excursion, hair a lot longer, and he basically runs through all of just five guys, knocking out Sonata, and then essentially challenging Sonata for the IWGP World Championship, pulling an Okada here without even wrestling one match. He's challenging for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. That's pretty bold uh, for a young lion coming back from excursion. And on top of that, he gets in the ring and does this. And the crowd loses their stuff, I should say. I'm trying to clean this video up a little bit. The crowd loses its stuff. Now, funny enough, on English commentary, both Chris Charlton and Kevin Kelly apparently missed this, that Yoda Suji signed off that he has joined Los Ingobernables de Japón. And after he's like kept, basically has to carry Hiromu, who's basically dead weight at this point in the backstage area. And they're like, oh my God, what's he doing with Hiromu? I'm like, he gave the... He's in LIJ. <laughs> it's like, but anyway, that that aside, um, yeah, big shocker there. It, when it looked like, and this is kind of a New Japan thing, uh, or especially a Gato thing when, with booking, is when somebody looks dead, they're at their worst, at their down, and they just did it with Sonata. And now we're, we're doing it with LIJ. They were pretty much beaten down at the end of the show, but just that little spark of life there. Yoda Suji coming in, becoming the latest member, the newest member of Los Ingobernables de Japón. And apparently, yes, it's been signed now. He will be challenging Sonata for the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. A lot of moving parts here. This was a really good show. This was a fun show from start to finish. I enjoyed it all the way. No real matches of the year. This was kind of, there was a lot of setup for new stuff, but the matches were entertaining enough on their own. Uh, that they carried their own weight, even the opening tag matches, which they really, really shortened that up and got to the meat of the show. I actually absolutely re uh, do recommend watching Wrestling Dontaku, the whole show, because the whole show, again, is an experience. This isn't one where I'm going to say, you know, here's the matches that you absolutely have to watch. I think the whole show is part of this continuing transition of New Japan. Again, we got a new another young lion making a debut and making a big splash. They're really trying to get across these young lions coming in. Obviously, Shota Umino, Red Narita, and now with Yoda Suji coming in as the new member of LIJ, uh, challenging the current and existing guard. Some of the old guard starting to get phased down the card a little bit, but not so much. Um, the Never Open Way Championship, problems with uh you know within the championship team and outside the championship team john moxley coming back at dominion 
them doing their best to try to get David Finley over, El Phantasmo making a return, and so on and so forth. Really packed card, a really entertaining show here at Wrestling Don Taku 2023. But I want to know what you guys think about this show. Let your voice be heard in the comment box below. What do you think about the new LIJ? What do you think about Sonata's title reign? What do you think about El Phantasmo? Is David Finley ever going to get across with the crowd, get over with the crowd as the leader of a gaijin Bullet Club? And are you excited to see John Moxley coming in with Shooter and uh, challenging Tanahashi, Okada, and Ishii, who have their own problems? And who do you think that third man is going to be? Again, let your voice be heard in the comment box below. Until next time, I'll see you guys here for more news, reviews, and all other kind of commentary involving New Japan and all other pro wrestling here on the Ransom Review Pro Wrestling. Have a good day.